who's, who, who's been here for... You know, we've been talking about this uh, for, since the first weekend of February. We've continued on one topic, renewing our mind for all this time. Who would have thought you could squeeze so much out of uh, one thought? But um, it keeps on coming. And uh, like I said, we've got a few more weeks to go. Um, I do want to uh, preface today by saying again, we'll be touching this morning, speaking about a, a, a subject that's somewhat sensitive in society. I'm going to do my best to uh, not be offensive, do my best to communicate clearly with grace, uh, but also I'm very aware too that we have uh, no kids' church this week, so there's younger people um, in the room. Not that I think there's anything there that, that, that um, we'll, we'll, they'll be unable to hear, but I just want to put that out there and make that clear too. So if you could pray with me, uh, that would be great. So, Father, we thank you for a great morning. Lord, we thank you for, God, the opportunity to put aside, Lord, all the cares, the worries, the troubles of life. And Lord, in worship, to just put you back in your rightful place, Father. We, God, as human beings, we desire as followers of Christ to keep you at the centre of everything, but we're realistic too, and we know that we slip our, our attention, diverts, and our, Lord, beautifully put, as, as Sarah said in, in communion, Lord, we just get distracted. But Father, I pray right now, Lord, would you just help us to maintain our focus? Would you pull our attention in? God, each person here, each individual in this room, would you open our eyes, let us see whatever it is the Holy Spirit wants us to see today. Father, would you let us hear whatever it is that the Holy Spirit wants each of us as individuals to hear. God, we are all on different parts of a journey when it comes to following you, when it comes to the working out, up and down, left and right. And so, Father, I do pray this morning, God, would you just take each of us another step on that journey, Lord. We desire with all our heart to be mature followers of Christ. Lord, even in a world that seems to have lost its way and God, to a large degree, perhaps in the midst of a church world that's struggling as well. So, Father, we commit this morning to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, once again, before I get started, thank you for the, the really thoughtful questions. I've, I've had several people contacting me, particularly in the last three weeks, with really, really good questions. The questions tell me that you're thinking about this stuff, and that's what I want. I don't want, uh, I, don't, I want us as a community to know who we follow. We follow Jesus, amen? We, we are Christ followers. We gave our life to Jesus. We didn't give our life to uh, the Christian religion. We haven't given our life to a philosophy, or we've given our life to, to, to Jesus Christ, who modeled how to live for us. We, we have decided to follow somebody else. In other words, we are not the God of our own life. That's a decision that I made at 19 when I gave my life to Christ. If I wasn't following Christ, I would be a different person today. I would be living differently. I would be making different choices. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be standing here. That's a given. And, and neither would all of you. If you had not made the decision, and who knows it's a daily decision, it's a daily decision, people. It's, it's not that you give your life to Christ one day and then the rest of it, you don't have to put any effort in or, or make tough choices. We do. This is, this is what following Jesus means. It means every day. Uh, uh, in Luke, when Luke records that great saying that Jesus said, you know, take up your cross and follow me, Luke actually adds the word daily. Take up your cross daily and follow me. So there's an acknowledgement there that, 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 that we, we, we daily get out of bed and we're going to be faced with certain pressures and tussles. And one day the pressures might be a one out of ten and following Jesus is easy. We have very little consequence. The next day following Jesus might be a nine out of ten. And it's a lot of hard effort on my part and I've got to stay focused. And it could cost me a great deal. That's just the Christian life. And in the West we haven't experienced a lot of that spectrum. We've, for a large, uh, very, very long period of time, the church was considered the answer to a lot of the problems in the world. The church was looked upon with favour. It was okay to be Christian. Nobody cared. As a matter of fact, being Christian was good because it probably means you're a, you'll be a better employee because you won't rip me off. You won't steal from the tills and so on. There'd be so many things about uh, your Christian faith that would make you attractive but now we're in a time where it's just not as attractive as it once was. And I don't mean in a doom and gloom way, but I think we're all smart enough to know the world has changed. And with that change, Christianity has become further and further pushed aside and less and less believable and less and less popular. And that's just the world that we live in and the times that we find ourselves in. But it's been really encouraging to me to hear the questions that people are asking. It tells me that you're thinking. Because I don't just want you to know what I believe about these things. I want you to know what you believe about these things and I want you to know why you believe them. Why do you believe them? 
Because I'm not... See, see, I think the greatest evangelistic strategy in the world, the way that we're going to reach the world for Jesus, is not going to be big crusades. It's not going to be gathering thousands and thousands of people together in a stadium and preach. Those days are over. The, way, the gospel travels best through relationships. Amen? G- Jesus said to 12 men, you go and you share your faith. And you be a light. You let people see what following Christ looks like and you share with them why you look that way. I look this way because 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ hung on a cross and died for my sins so that I could come back into relationship with God. When God looks at me, he doesn't see the gunk and the muck and the yuck. And God's taken this life and he's turned all things around and uses them for good for me. That's my story. That's, that's my testimony. That's your testimony. But the gospel travels out through people. People. I remember uh, I used to teach, well, I still do, I teach evangelism on YWAM, Youth with the Mission Training Schools. And one of the, the uh, things I've come across in, in, in years and years of studying and reading about evangelism is that when Billy Graham used to do crusades and uh, 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 he was interviewed with his crusades and all these people would come forward, he would say that, that pretty much everybody that came forward at a Billy Graham crusade was brought there by a Christian friend or relative. In other words, somebody had built relationship with them, had shone a light, had shared with them, was honest enough about their faith, who they were in Christ, that one day they said, I'm going to see Billy Graham, would you come with me? And they said yes. On the back, I'm assuming of the integrity and the life of that person that had invested into them and loved them and built relationship with them. So that's what I'm hoping out of this. We're talking about issues that are dividing the church. We're talking about issues that are dividing culture. And we don't want to be a part of the division. We don't want to be part of the division. We want to be part of the answer. Amen? Our part. It doesn't mean that it will be the answer to everybody. Some people are still going to hate it. Well, that's between them and God. But to the best of our ability, we want to be part of the answer. And one other thing I want to say. Since I've uh, uh, sort of started uh, covering these topics over the last few weeks, something weird has happened in my own life. I'm, I'm just feeling this incredible increase of the fear of God in my life. I just feel like I'm looking inwardly and examining my own life and going, well, you know what, it's easy as a church to point our fingers out there and go, these are the big problems and everybody's got this. But I feel like God's saying, well, you know what, if you want to go there, I'm going to make you look in here. I want you to look in your own heart. Have a look at those ways in your own heart where, where as, as I think David writes in the Psalms, now search me, O Lord, know me and see if there be any wicked way in me. And that word wicked doesn't mean evil in the Hebrew, it means slightly off kilter, slightly bent. Are there things in my life that I need to address? Are there, are there, there logs I need to get out of my own eyes so that I can see clearly to help somebody else with the plank in theirs? And so that's what's been going on in my life. And I'm, my prayer is I hope that's what's happening with us uh, as a community as well as we go down this path. See, here's the truth. The world out there could come into alignment with the way we think and change its way of living. But without surrendering to Jesus, it'll find other ways to destroy itself. Without hearing the gospel and without knowing the person of Jesus... The world will find other ways to destroy itself. And the church will continue to be as powerless as it currently finds itself right now. But here's the good news. If the church looks at our own stuff and cleans that up, then we'll discover greater degrees of God's power flowing in us and through us. And I believe we can make a greater difference in the world. If you've got a Bible there, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. I'm I'm not going to walk from here a lot today because I'm just going to pretty much read what I've got here. Uh, I said to my wife um, yesterday, I've been preaching for, geez, over 30 years now. And this is probably the hardest message that I feel like I've put together and had to preach. So I'm just going to stick to this because I don't want to lose myself anywhere. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Everyone say, preach the word. Preach Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct. Everyone say correct. Part of preaching the word is sometimes bringing correction to people. Rebuke. Everyone say rebuke. Sometimes it's rebuking. But it's also and encourage. Say encourage. It's correct rebuke. Encourage with great patience and with careful instruction. Not like a bull in a china shop. For the time will come, watch this, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound Doctrine. The Greek word sound is where we get the word hygienic from. There's going to come a time when people will not put up with sound doctrine. It's not that they won't like it, they won't put up with it. It's, it's, it's different to go, well, that's your opinion, I don't, I don't agree with that, it's fine, we can still be friends. No, this is beyond not liking it, so they will not put up with it. They will not put up with it. 
instead to suit their own desires. Did you see that? To suit their own desires. They'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Now, here's the thing. False teachers, false doctrines, etc., they only exist because there's a market for them. People want to hear stuff because their own desires are driving them. As long as there's desire in the heart of man for something, somebody will teach it and bring it to the public square. Because it's driven. It's like business. If you've got a product, that product has to, ma- there has to be a demand for the product or you're not going to, the product dies, right? Well, there, there, there's, a, there's a demand and a desire at the moment for people to just want to cling to what their heart desires and I want people to tell them that every desire they have is okay. Now, Paul's, uh, Paul's writing here to Timothy, a Christian, in the context again of church. He's saying there'll be a time where people just want to hear what they want to hear. Because it's coming out of their own desire. It's not coming from God. It's their own desires. And they're giving in to their own desires. Now, this is inevitable in a culture that preaches become more self-aware and get in touch with your feelings. We become more aware of self and less aware of God. John the Baptist put it right when he said in John 3.30, he said, he must become greater and I must become less. He must increase and I must decrease. Society speaks the complete opposite message. See, both of these truths are are, are relevant. But we don't become more self-aware or get in touch with our feelings so that they can become the compass for our own lives. We don't get in touch with our feelings and become more self-aware so that they can be the things that lead us down the path and help us make our decisions and stuff. That's not why we do that. So today we're going to keep looking at another area of culture, an area where we've definitely seen a societal shift towards personal desire. And I want to talk about gender. Very quiet. It's okay. Now remember, in answering the question of a biblical definition of marriage, we've already answered the question of same-sex relationships, sexual relationships, and we've also already answered the big question about how many genders are there. I went on a website, uh, medicinenet.com, and uh, just in getting ready for this, I've been reading both sides of the argument. Just so you know, I'm reading both sides of, of everything I'm bringing you. I'm not, I'm not coming to you saying, I'm just, I've made my mind up and I'm reading. Some people make their mind up, go to the Bible and say, I want to find, find how the Bible supports what I already believe. That's a poor way of looking at the Word of God. We go to the Word of God, we find out what the Word of God says, and then we come into alignment with that. And, and, and so I've been reading broadly and all around and looking at reports and medical stuff and psychology stuff. I am not a doctor. I am not a psychologist, a psychiatrist. I am not a mental health practitioner. Please do not think I'm standing here acting like I am. I am not. I am a pastor of a church who's doing his best to try to understand what the Bible says about some of these difficult issues and present it in a way that hopefully inspires you to go and look at the Word of God and come to your own conclusions. That's all I'm trying to do. But on this particular website, um, medicinenet.com, the article uh, said that, and apparently the article was medically reviewed on the 9th of February this year, and they stated there are 72 different kinds of gender now. I went to a whole bunch of other websites, and I saw numbers that went anywhere from as low as four different types of gender up to 150 different types of gender. Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. Seven, right back in the beginning, tells us this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. That tells me three things in that passage. Number one, that we have been created by God. We are not the creators. We are the created. Culture has slowly but surely told people that they can have whatever they want, and more importantly, they can be whatever they want. In other words, you can be the creator. You can become the creator. And it's finding its climax right now in this gender debate where not only can you be anything you want to be, you can be an astronaut, a politician, but now you can be any sex you want to be as well because it's your choice, regardless of anything biological. The second thing it tells me is that we've been created in his image. So in all of creation, mankind is the only thing created in his image image. Humans are image bearers of God. Male and female are both image bearers of God. 
And when you start messing with male and female, you start messing with the very image of God that God created and placed down here on planet Earth. And the third thing it tells me is that we've been created male and female. Now, here's the thing. I hear this quite a bit, and I've come across this a lot in my reading. The gender is a cultural construct. Anyone ever heard that? Gender is a cultural construct. Well, let me tell you this. As a believer in Christ, gender is not a cultural construct for Christians. God created gender before cultures came to be in existence. In other words, before cultures arose, there was male and there was female. So the argument that culture, uh, that the gender is a cultural construct for a Christian, I'm speaking to those of you that claim to follow Christ, that believe in the word of God, I'm speaking to you saying if you read your Bible and you take it seriously and you go back to Genesis, then you will know that gender cannot be a cultural construct because gender existed before culture came into place. Amen? Amen? Gender was there. We see it in Genesis chapter 1. Now, trans... I'm going to use words here, and I, 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 again, I'm, I, again, I want to just say I am not a sociologist either. I don't know everything about everything. And the more I dig deeper into this, the more I realize that you can, you can offend anybody with anything by saying anything. Now, I'm just going to throw it out there and go, because I don't know all the stuff, I'm just going to give you my heart and use words. And if you're offended by that, know my heart. I'm not trying to offend you. But here's the thing. Transgender ideology attacks all three of these points we just saw in Genesis. It says that regardless of biology, you can be the creator and create yourself. It says that there is no existing image that you bear. There's no existing template, so you can be whatever you want. And you no longer need to be restricted to just two options. The world is basically your oyster. There's up to 150 pick and choose. It's almost like life today for young people is a choose your own adventure story. Anyone ever remember them when they were young? Choose your own adventure story. There's stories, there's books, somebody writes with a definitive start and an end and the author created that story and the author tells the story and the author owns the story and the author directs the story and guides the story and it's the author's story. And then there's these books called Choose Your Own Adventure where you get to the end of a certain thing and it says, if you want to go down that path, turn to page 72. If you want to go down that path, turn to page 41. I used to love Choose Your Own Adventure books as a kid, but guess what? I always died in them. I always made the wrong choices. I always made a choice where I fell into a pit and got eaten by an alligator or, you know, got shot by a fire. I always made the wrong decisions. I'm so glad when it comes to who I am, I don't have to try to make decisions and work it out. I've got a Father in heaven that tells me who I am. I don't have to try to choose my own adventure when it comes to this stuff. God has answers. Now, transgender ideology, if followed to its logical conclusion is about becoming your own creator and having freedom to create a species of people that exists separate from the biblical creation of male and female. Think about this. People to whom the Bible does not apply anymore because they were not created by God. If we follow this thing through to its logical conclusion, we will come a day now, people can laugh at me right now and say, no, it won't happen. Hey, people laughed at our grandparents when they said you never have same-sex marriage in this country. So I'm going to say this to you. This is just how my brain thinks. I'm not saying this is the Bible. I'm just opening up this crazy world inside my head and letting you see a little bit. We keep going down this path. Eventually, you end up with more than male and female. You end up with the other 148 types. Guess what? You give them a Bible and say, this speaks to you. They go, where am I? Now, this speaks to males and females, the ones that God made. We're a separate, almost a separate species. And you can't find us in the word of God and we don't find ourselves in there. We're carving our own path. This is part of my concern, my deep-seated concern with this, is, is these decisions that we make are taking us further and further and further away. And nothing is going to get us further away from this than destroying and attacking the very image of God by going after the image bearers. Now, let's be clear. The Bible does not directly speak to a person who feels like they are in the wrong body. But it does speak implicitly to the issue of gender and it encourages us to live within the framework of our biological sex. Jesus believed this. Uh, uh, Jesus quoted Genesis 1.27 in Matthew 19 and, and verse 4. Jesus quotes this. He says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female. Jesus believed Genesis. Now, if Jesus believed Genesis and I'm following Jesus, I'm going to believe Genesis. Jesus himself supported this. Now, I don't need to quote all the biblical references to male and female, man and woman, 
sons and daughters, husbands and wives, bride and bridegroom. It's not just that I'm on the side of Jesus, but I am on the side of Jesus, by the way. But science is also on the side of Jesus. There was an article, um, an article called Genetic Mechanisms of Sex Determination by Laura Hake and Claire O'Connor. They were biologists from Boston College, and they explained this, that in placental mammals, the presence of a Y chromosome determines sex. Normally, females contain two X chromosomes, and males contain an X and a Y chromosome. On rare occasions, however, someone can be born with more than two chromosomes or with only one chromosome, resulting in hormonal and sexual development that is ambiguous or mixed. So this can happen. There can be, uh, 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 in terms of our physical presentation, there can be um, ambiguity. There can be things that don't quite come out um, what we would call societally normal. Thus, individuals with 47 XXY and 47XYY carrier types are males, while individuals with 45X and 47XXX carrier types are females. In other words, even when genitalia appear ambiguous, a person is, by virtue of their chromosomes, either male or female. In other words, chromosomes determine biological sex, not feelings. Not even appearance. Chromosomes. The truth is, a good definition of truth is this, that which corresponds to reality. That's a good definition of truth. Truth is not relative, and we should only pursue things that have a basis in reality. For example, I've been getting all these emails recently. I don't know if you get them, but I've been getting emails every day saying, hey, we've checked out your website. We think it's great. We can make it better. Just would you like us to do some work for you? I get hundreds of them a day. The only problem is this, that a rice church doesn't have a website. It doesn't have a website. So there's no basis in reality of, 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 of these emails. So I don't click the button, I don't pursue them, I don't go any further down that path. I don't follow it because it has no basis in reality. No matter how amazing the offer is, and no, and no matter what the perceived benefits are, it's simply not true. Because I don't have a website. God made male and female. Male and female should be celebrated because God created them, and when God created male and female, he said these words, it is good. But gender ideology... Not necessarily, be clear on this, not necessarily gender-confused people, not necessarily individuals that struggle with gender dysphoria, but gender ideology is stopping the celebration by declaring male and female are the problem. So, is gender part of the problem? I don't think so. God said male and females were good, but it is possible that gender stereotypes contribute to some of the confusion. Did you know you can be a man, love ballet, and flowers? You can. You can be a man, and your favorite color can be pink. You can. You can be a man and love cooking cupcakes and icing them with cherries and bows. And, and guess what? You can be a man, 100% male, and enjoy that. You can be a woman, you can love driving trucks. You can love watching football. You can even play NRL nowadays. I don't have a problem with it because your skill level is way better than the boys. The boys just want to bash each other these days. <laughs> the point is this, that we need to be very careful that gender stereotypes, maybe gender stereotypes are part of the problem in society today, that we've got such uh, 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 narrow pictures. It's interesting, I was reading a, a, a book this week and they pointed, made this fact, they pointed out this fact that years and years ago when we were young, there were these girls at school called tomboys. Remember tomboys? Anyone ever a tomboy at school? Yeah, exactly. There were these, these girls called tomboys. Now, what that meant was you were still a girl, but you'd rather hang out with the boys. You'd rather play with the trucks or something like that. Um, you, 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 you looked like and enjoyed things that were societally more typical for a male. So we called you tomboys, right? But that was okay, because you grew up and you got married and you weren't trying to change your body or change your gender, you just knew that, hey, I just like this, I'm not like every other girl with bows and so and, and, and so it was okay. Nowadays, you rarely ever see a tomboy. Because the minute they start feeling like, or we notice that they might play with a truck or not want to wear pink or whatever, we straight away, oh, maybe you're in the wrong body. I know this sounds weird, but I'll tell you what, there are medical practices all around the world and in certain countries way down the path that the minute a child goes to see a psychologist, the psychologist straight away is trained and told, if a child says, I'm in the wrong body, you say, yes, you are. Now, how can I medically help you? I'm not making this stuff up. You can do your own research and read about it. 
I've got some books I can recommend later on if people want to check out some stuff. First time I went for a walk with Joshua. I've got a mate of mine, Joshua Tumbleboy. Tumbleboy, I love his last name, Tumbleboy. He sounds like a musical instrument. I'm playing the Tumbleboy. He's from the Solomon Islands, an island called Choisel in the Solomon Islands. And they are, they are the darkest skinned human beings I've ever seen. Like, he used to walk down. We had this road near the YWAM base at the time, and there was no lights. And I would walk down at night time, reading, you know, re- um, listening. Uh, remember Walkmans? I used to have a Walkman in, listening to worship music, just worshiping God at two in the morning. And Joshua would play the trick on me all the time. He'd be coming the other way, and he'd wait till he was like that far away from me, and he'd go, like that. And the eyes in the teeth, and I'd freak out and drop me. He would do it all the time. But he was a great guy, Joshua. But I remember the first time he came from Solomon Islands to Brisbane to do a YWAM school, and I was there. And we went for a walk. Me and him got on really well to start. We went for a walk down the road our first time. And as we're walking down the road, Joshua, he grabs my hand. I'm telling you, I froze like this. And, and of course, Joshua, he just grabbed my hand and kept walking and then realized, oh, and he stopped. And I stared straight ahead because it was so foreign to me that a man would hold hands. And I stared, and I, I didn't know what to do. And he said, what's wrong? And I said, do you always do this? <laughs> and when I said that, he leant in. He had one hand like that. He leant in with the other, put it around the other side, went, do what? <laughs> that! We don't do that here. But you know what? I went on an outreach to the Solomon Islands. Everybody's walking around. Boys are holding hands. Boys are sitting on each other's lap. Nothing sexual about it. Just very, very free to, 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 to uh, express that level of intimacy with somebody of the same sex with no sexual connotation whatsoever. I come back to my culture and we see something like that, we instantly have a picture. We, we think, oh, that person must be, they must be gay. They must be homosexual. They must be a lesbian, whatever. Because we're not comfortable expressing that kind of... of and, and so we have these stereotypes. And we need to be careful with gender stereotypes that, that, that when we see certain activities or certain behaviours that we don't push people down a path that they don't need to go down. And unfortunately, we live in a society right now that is wanting to find those people, seek those people out and push them down a path that they don't need to go down. Second Samuel chapter 1, verse 26, here's King David. This is what King David said about his relationship with Jonathan, King Saul's son. He said, I grieve for you after Jonathan had died. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of a woman. Now, all the Aussie men get a bit uncomfortable with that one. (laughs) There was nothing sexual about it. He was just saying, you know what? I feel much more comfortable. I feel so comfortable in our relationship, Jonathan. I feel so relaxed in our relationship, Jonathan that I feel like I could probably tell you things that maybe I couldn't even tell a woman. I could let you into spaces in my world where I feel much more comfortable with you than I do with people of the opposite sex. Does that make him a woman? Did it make him gay? No, not at all. And we have to admit and acknowledge that we have all kinds of gender stereotypes and are those gender stereotypes playing into the hands of transgender ideology? I personally believe they do. And we've got to be smarter and stop being led down those paths ourselves. Now, just because God originally made us male and female, like every other area of creation, we've been impacted by sin. And there are people who genuinely feel like they're living in the wrong body. There are people who genuinely feel that. I read the testimony of a person who was struggling with gender dysphoria, and here's how they described it. They said it was like having a creepy serum injected all over my body to create an odd numb yet painful feeling coursing through my blood vessels and seeping into my flesh. My torso and limbs feel like static and not from pins and needles. My stomach is always uneasy and my body is slightly tensed up. Can you imagine living like that every day? Every time you had to go to a bathroom. Every time you got dressed. Every time you had to introduce yourself to somebody. Every time you looked in a mirror at your own body. Every time you had to show identification somewhere. Well, there are people who do. Not because that's the way God made them, but because we live in a fallen world that's been impacted by sin. God didn't make people like that. Last week we talked about about same-sex sexual relationships. God didn't make anybody, uh, I, I use the term respectfully, God didn't make anybody gay. We live in a fallen world and things have been messed up. And it's no different when it comes to this issue. I completely believe 
that people can feel like, feel like, feel like they're in the wrong body. And we need to have some compassion for that reality for people. Because there are people who genuinely feel that way. Now, not everybody that feels that way genuinely feels that way for the same reasons. Uh, research would show there's this thing called social contagion. I don't know if any of you have heard of social contagion. It, it, it's where, where one person, uh, 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 when you, they go back and they do studies, uh, we had outbreaks of certain things like anorexia uh, nervosa. was a big outbreak of, 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 of people you know, thinking they were overweight and not wanting to eat and starving themselves to death and so on. These things don't happen in isolation. It's not like one there, one there, one there. When these things happen in society, they generally tend to happen in clusters. All of a sudden, you've never heard of it. Now everybody's doing it. All of a sudden, no one felt it. Now everybody's feeling it. And they call it a social contagion. And there are reports and studies done in schools throughout Europe and America that I came across where they said nobody, no one in, in this school uh, struggled with, with their gender. And then all of a sudden, one person did. Then 10 people in the same class, all in the same age group, they all came out and struggled with it. And they're saying this is not a natural thing. This is what they call, call a, a social contagion where something happens in the world or in society and other people catch on to it. I don't want to go into details, but I, th I believe as a family, we've had first-hand experience with this, raising our kids. 20 years ago, this is coming from a guy called Stephen McAlpine. He wrote a book called Being the Bad Guys. He is an English literacy teacher, I think. His wife is a psychologist. And here's what he said, 20 years ago, if you felt that you were in the wrong body, clinical psychologist's role was to try and realign your psychology back with your physiology, i.e. bring your thinking back into alignment with the reality of your body. However, nowadays they do the opposite. You are who you think you are, so realign the body with your thinking. Realign your body with your thinking. It's, it's terrible. Abigail Schreier. Uh, I highly recommend this book. She's not a Christian, but she wrote a book called Irreversible Damage. She puts this whole thing in a humorous way, so we'll lighten the mood a little bit. She says, a woman walks into a therapist's office dragging a teenage son. Doctor, she says, please help, please help. My son thinks he's a chicken. The son says, if there's one thing I can tell you about chickens, it's that we know who we are. <laughs> Where's your proof, the woman demands of her son. You have no feathers. True, the son replies, I went through the wrong puberty. The woman turns to the therapist, you see what I mean? He's lost his mind. The therapist replies, you're the one talking to a chicken. <laughs> That's what's going on in some of these professional quarters at the moment. I read a report where uh, in America, I can only speak in America, but I read a report where they're saying that psychologists are now being told if a nine-year-old child comes in and says uh, that I think I might be in the wrong body, you're to encourage that straight away and say, yes, then if that's how you feel, that's true. Now what can we do to try to bring your body into alignment with how you feel? These are nine and ten-year-old kids. This is an ideology. It's an ideology that is just pushing it's pushing and making its way into society and becoming mainstream and normal. So where did the change come from? How do we go from gender confusion being a psychological problem where the mind needs to be conformed to the body to it now being a physiological problem where the body needs to be conformed to the mind? So it's at this point, it's important that we are able to separate gender ideology from people who struggle with gender identity. People who struggle with gender identity need love, grace acceptance and understanding. But gender ideology needs to be confronted, exposed and pushed back on. In my opinion, gender ideology is evil. It needs to be stood against and the biggest victims of gender ideology are people who struggle with gender identity. The biggest victims are the ones that are right now changing their sex and deciding that they're going to follow their feelings. They're victims of an ideology that's being pushed. Sometimes I think we look at them and we think they're the problem. They're not the problem. They just were a young person one day or, a, or that, that struggled with feeling like, I don't fit the stereotype. I think I might be a boy. I think I might be a girl. They thought that. And then there's this ideology, this cultural thing that's coming in behind that and plucking them out and going, now we're going to take you for a ride, take you for a ride, take you for a ride. They're victims of a lot of this stuff. And we've got to separate the two. Gender confused or gender dysphoric people 
are one thing. It's an ideology that's coming after them. Now, very clearly, I'm going to state again, I believe there are two sexes, male and female. Male and female. But I do understand that we live in a world that doesn't think that. And they're pushing this stuff on vulnerable people. As Christians, we're meant to stand with the vulnerable. We're meant to support the, the, the downtrodden and the outcast. We're meant to fight for these people. Not ostracize them. We're meant to fight for them. And fighting means two things. It means showing them tremendous amounts of grace like Jesus did, but it also means as a church, standing firm on the truth like Jesus did. Not compromising truth. On Friday, June 7th, this Friday, I happened to be sitting down at my computer, an exclusive article came up from the Daily Mail, I think it was in the UK. And it was the, and it was the, first, uh, it was the first landmark 15-year study carried out in the Netherlands on more than 2,700 children who struggle with gender dysphoria. They, 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 they plotted, they graphed these kids from around 12, 13, right through to mid-20s. Uh, it was around a 15-year, they followed these kids, 2,700 kids for 15 years to see how this outplayed. And here's what they found. They found that uh, most of these children grew out of their gender dysphoria by their early 20s. Come across another study that actually said 61 to 88% of people, if we leave these kids alone, 61 to 88% of them are going to grow out of it by their late teens. We're not giving them a chance to grow out of it. I believe this is a spiritual thing. And I think this is where the church needs to open its eyes a little bit. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. Any time in the Bible you see a minority mentality or a minority group winning power, there's a spiritual thing behind it, isn't there? Take the nation of Israel. They shouldn't have won a lot of things they won, but God was with them. There was this spiritual power, and the power was God, and this minority would win. I've got to be honest, I'm looking at the world today going, there is a minority narrative out there. Not everybody is transgendered. Not everybody is, is, is living in same-sex relationships. Uh, not everybody is for gay marriage, all these big cultural things. I would dare say that probably at the heart, if people were brutally honest and they weren't worried about being cancelled or fired, it would be a very small minority. Yet that minority voice and spirit is dominating cultures and countries and lawmakers and educators. It's in schools, it's in politics, it's in the medical profession. How does that happen? Well, I think we wrestle not with flesh and blood. This is not a natural thing that we're in the midst of right now. As a church, we need to shine our light. As a church, we need to stand on truth. As a church, we need to love with great grace. As a church, we need to stop compromising. As a church, we need to examine our own hearts and our own lives and get ourselves right with Christ. And call out to God again, Father, you have been a powerful God many, many times. We need you to be a powerful God for us now. God, we need you to come sift our hearts. God, we need you to show us our own stuff because we want to be pure and clean vessels because, God, I need your power. I'm not going to make a difference out there in the world if I do not carry the power of God with me. And I've got to stop compromising with things. But see, kids aren't being told that, that you'll grow out of it by a certain point. There's a lot of destructive evil going on around the world in this space. And ultimately, it's an attack on the image of God in mankind. You break down male and female, the very image bearer of God. You destroy that. You start taking down the very image of God himself on earth. This is why this is more than just a natural thing. So, let me wrap it up. Does the Bible give us anything practical that may help people in this space? I said practical, not necessarily easy. And I think it does. I want to throw two proposals at you to finish up. Number one, my first proposal is around the idea of identity. I came across an article in 2021. It was written by the University of Melbourne. And the opening line of the article said this, gender identity is at the core of our sense of self. And I wondered, could this be part of the problem? Identity. We're looking for identities. We're searching for identities. And it's amazing how you you can find an identity in some of this stuff. It becomes who you are. Who are you? Well, you're not Jackie anymore. You're a transgender human or you're a 
gay or a lesbian or whatever the terminology that you want to want, want, want to call yourself. And, and it's unfortunate and it's sad, but we live in a time and a day and an age now where you could be a heteronormal uh, young kid at school that doesn't have a lot of friends and nobody has a lot of time for you and you're not popular, but you stand up in class one day and say, I'm a cat or I'm a, a dog or I'm this or I'm that, and all of a sudden you get a bit of popularity, you get a bit of momentum, you get a bit of focus, you get a bit of attention, and that feels really, 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 really good. I wonder whether, whether this moment we're in, whether part of the solution for the church is, is, is identity. To realise what identity really is and where we get identity from. See, have you ever noticed that people tend to bend their life towards an identity if they want to embrace it? You know, you dress normally one day, then you decide I want to be emo, so then you go and buy black stuff and black... You know, because you, you want to identify with that, so then you start bending your life towards that. You start listening to that music, eating that food or whatever it is that you do. You, you want to be a surfer, so if you want to be a surfer, you might look like a, an accountant, but then you decide you want to be a surfer at school, so all of a sudden you're growing your scraggly, long blonde hair and you don't brush your hair anymore and, you know, we, and you start buying rip curls and we bend ourselves towards the identity that, we, that we're embracing, that we want to have. Now, here's the thing. Identity in Christ is the ultimate landing strip. Our search for identity ultimately is to be found in Jesus. This is the Christian story. You don't have to run around trying to make an identity. How tiring. No wonder we have a young generation of kids depressed and struggling because life is so hard, they don't even know who they are. It's almost like they're being told, you've got to work that one out as well. There's enough stuff to work out without having to work out who you are. Paul writes this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10 to 11. He says, and, and having put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator, here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. In other words, your identity is not in all these other things. It's in Christ, and it's Christ in you. Galatians 3, 26 to 28. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ. Paul is not negating the natural elements of identity, but he's making them subservient to our ultimate identity, which is in God. Our ultimate identity is found in God. As the song said, I am who you say I am. I am a child of God, ultimately. And that's what brings us all together. Jew and Gentile, slave and free, barbarian, Scythian, male, female. We're all one in Christ. Our identity is all found in Christ. I'm glad I don't have to try to create an identity for myself. God's already given me one. I just need to learn to accept it and walk in it. My second proposal I want to leave you with. We're called to glorify God in our bodies. In other words, we have a body and it's intrinsic to who we are. God made the male body and a female body and we are told we need to glorify God with this body. We, we have a very poor theology of body in the Western church. We, 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 it's all about spirit, spirit. We don't realize that, that our body is just as much a part of our spirit. We, our bodies are going to be resurrected one day. When we get to the other side, whatever it looks like, guess what? You're going to be in a body. You're not just going to be floating around like a wisp, like the wisp. The Word of God tells us you're going to have a body. Our body is important. And our body is part of the way that we glorify God on the earth by using this body in an appropriate way. The way that God intended for us to use it. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20. Do you not know? I'll tell you what now, Paul. No, most of us don't. So thanks for bringing it up. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. I love that. You are not your own. I am not my own. I have been bought with a price and I'm owned by somebody. I am the possession of somebody other than just myself. That's awesome. Because if I was just, when, when I was just the possession of myself, I screwed things up majorly. Majorly. And it was only when I realized I'm not my own, I've been bought with a price, and I brought myself under subjection to God, that my life has started to make sense. That the pressure valve has been released. I ain't got to make all this stuff up now. I'm a follower of Jesus. I have context and purpose to my life. 
He says, you are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, because of that, honor God with your body. Honor God. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever looked at your body in a mirror and gone, I've got to honor God with this thing? Hey? I've got to honor God with this thing. What does that mean? I'm going to wrestle with that. What does it mean? Well, I know the first thing it means, accept what he's given me. Accept what he has given me. To, to want to change this, to want to go, oh, I want to get rid of this part and that part and become this, that's to dishonor the body that God gave you. I'm not saying that, that it's, it's easy for people that struggle with this for you. I'm not saying that. But the same thing that I would say, if you struggle with same-sex uh, attraction, uh, I'm, I would encourage you, don't give in to that attraction because a same-sex sexual relationship is wrong according to God. Well, I'll say the same thing here. You may struggle and think you're in the wrong body. I have grace and compassion for you. I really genuinely do. And I can't imagine what it feels like. But I'd say the same thing to you. Don't mess with it because God gave it to you and you need to somehow not give in to that feeling and learn to honor God with the body that he gave you. What we do in our bodies is important, and it's meant to honor God. The greatest way we can dishonor that is don't accept the biological gender that he gave to you. Reject your God-given gender is to dishonor your body. Romans 1.24, therefore God gave them over. Speaking about humanity, when humanity decided we want nothing to do with God, look at what he says. He says, therefore God gave them over into the sinful desires of their hearts. He said, okay, go your way to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies. He speaks about the body. This wasn't just a sin thing. It's not just some ethereal, uh, spiritual thing up there. He says, by diving into this, he said, you're degrading your bodies. We can honor our bodies. We can degrade them. Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in other words, because God's been so good to you, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Offer your body to God. Don't offer your body to some science experiment. Don't offer your body to your feelings and emotions. Offer your bodies to God. We offer our bodies to God, not our own feelings. The problem with living sacrifices is they want to take control and jump off the altar. That's why it's a daily choice. I was get the musos back. We're going to finish with that song. I want to finish with that song. Who you say I am. Isaiah 29, verse 15 to 16. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their work in darkness and think, who sees us? Who will know? There's a lot of stuff going on in dark places. There's a lot of stuff going on in dark places, especially when it comes to this. You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, you did not make me? That's where we're heading. Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? Male and female, God created them. Again, we need to have great grace on people that are struggling. But we cannot give in to the lie that there's 150 genders. God created them, male and female, He created them. Gender ideology says we are beings with an image to create. Christianity says we are beings with an image to reflect. That is the image of God. This is a call for all believers, no matter what we struggle with, no matter what we battle, no matter what we face. We're called to follow Jesus, to put to death the flesh, to live for God, to reflect His grace and truth to a world that hasn't yet tasted and seen the Lord is good. I'll finish with this statement. It's a man called Alan Noble. He's an associate professor of English at Oklahoma Baptist University. He writes this. There is no image for you to maintain because you were made in the image of God. There is no identity for you to discover or create because your identity was never actually in question. It felt like it was because we live in liquid modernity. But that feeling isn't reality. And there is no need for you to express your identity 
to make it more solid or to compete in the ever-growing marketplace of images because your personhood doesn't need affirmation from other human beings to make it valid. We are created and made in the image of God. Male and female, He created them. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. If I can leave you with this final thought, we need to be praying like never before. We need to be praying like never before. Because we're wrestling with something that is beyond our capacity in the natural to just stop. We need to be praying. But I also want to call the church too. I believe we need to be vocal about gender ideology. It's uncomfortable. Maybe it doesn't feel loving. I'm not talking about gender dysphoric people or people struggling with identity. I'm talking about the ideology that is behind it. The push that is behind it. The push that is getting telling educators to start reading books to children at five years of age. There's one school in the States and the teacher stands up and says to the kids in front of a whiteboard, tell me what a boy does. She writes on the board. And then tell me what a girl does. And they write it on the board. And then she says to the boys, are there any boys here that like doing anything that a girl does? And of course, a boy five years of age, yeah, I like doing that. Any girl here like doing something? Yep. And that's the beginning point where the teacher then says to the child, well, you're probably not male. You're probably not fully female. You're something else. It's like something out of a horror movie when you start reading some of this stuff. I'm, I'm, and I'm not making this stuff up. Please, please know I'm not making these stories up. There's some good books out there. There are things you can read. There's YouTube stuff you can get. There are people now that are starting to speak against and about some of this stuff. It's one of the biggest evils. In fact, I would almost call it a genocide against the whole generation of young people. These young kids have been used as test crash dummies for an ideology that's untested, unscientific, unresearched. But this ideology is prepared to play with their lives. And it's pure evil. As a church, we can do something about it. Amen. Why don't we stand to our feet? Again, I know that we, we, I've touched on some things here. If you've got questions or things you're unsure of, if you feel like I've said something you haven't quite understood, please give me a call this week, email me. I'd love to work out a time we can sit down and chat because I know that some of this stuff touches very, very close to people's real existence. If, if, if it's tweet something for you this morning and you'd like prayer, then just while we're singing, feel free to come on forward. We'd love to pray with you, stand with you. Other than that, I'm going to pray. Feel free to go if you need to. There's tea and coffee next door. We're going to worship. So, Father God, I want to thank you, Lord, this morning. God, I want to thank you, Father, for the truth of your word. God, I want to thank you for the grace of God upon each and every one of us. Father, none of us in this room, God, none of us here deserve to be where we are. God, we are here because of your grace. God, we're here because, Father, you have sustained us. God, you carry us. God, we're here because you accept us, warts and all. And we thank you for that this morning, Father. But God, I pray for us as a church. And God, I pray for all the churches. God, I pray for every Christian in this nation. That, Lord, you would take the blinders off and we would start to see this ideology for what it is, God. Father, it is an outright work of the devil, targeting a whole generation of innocent children. And it's being supported, God, politically. It's being supported scientifically, God, in medical practices. It's being supported in schools. And Father, enough is enough, God. We pray in the name of Jesus that, God, you would begin to open heaven. And God, do something supernatural, Father. Would you put a stop to this stuff, God? And Father, each of us individually, God, if there are things we need to do in our daily lives, if there are people we need to talk to, if there are things we need to say, God, would you give us the courage, God, and the grace and the strength, Lord, to stand in the gap and to stand in those spaces. And God, to be able to say, no, I don't agree. No, I don't think that's good. I won't have that. I won't put my kids under that. Father, I pray that we would have strength and courage from the Holy Spirit. And God, thank you that we do not need to go and find who we are. We are who you say we are. 
God. You have given us an identity, Father, and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen.